Thanks, guys, for uh, attending. Um, my name is Sola Pedersen. I do uh, performance work on the middleware team. So, do mostly work on EAP, but mostly all of the middleware. So, we can do it on WordX, or we can do it on Keycloak, or other modules as well. Um, today, I'll talk a bit more about the performance on Java in general and how we do it internally on our team. Since we're this many, I wish that if you have any questions regarding performance on Java or anything, just um, don't be afraid to ask while we're going and we can take it from there. So let's try to have this dialogue on it. So uh, <clears throat> we want to do like a, a lessons from what we learned. Um, but we, after reviewing the agenda, we also wanted to give you some tools to, so you can do this on your own with your own applications instead of us just giving you just all the properties or all the things that we've done to going into EP7. So I'll try to talk a bit about the methodology we're doing when we do performance or profiling at the team, the tools we're using, what tools we're using for profiling, and then some benchmarking. Also look at um, the performance improvements we've done for EAP7, the modules there. So let's start. Um, so the methodology. Um, so first we want, when we have a problem, what we want to look at is what, uh, what prevents my application from running faster. So the what, we use monitoring tools. We use fairly basic tools. I'll just display them fairly quickly for you. Um, but we try to get an overview over what's happening on the machine before we try to go for, further on the profiling side. And then we do a where, where we try to find out where the bottleneck hides. And for that, we use profiling tools. And at the end, we try to look at how we can improve performance. So we try to do a top-down top approach. As I said, we use common Unix or Linux tools in the beginning to just have an idea on the system level, like user, CPU usage, et cetera. Um, if we have a lot of IO8, why do we have that? Can we change that? Then we look at the JVM level. Are we creating a lot of garbage? Are we doing class loading? Are our methods not being compiled, et cetera? And then we look at our APIs, our algorithms, the threading model. Do we have enough threads? Like if you're running JBoss, have we configured threads correctly according to the machine we have, et cetera? So what are we looking for? Um, First, we want to see, OK, if we have a lot of system time, we usually do not have a problem with our application. Then we most likely have a problem with either networking, scheduling, swapping. There's a hardware issue. So we need to look into that before we do any of the profiling thing. Um, if we do IO wait, well, disk activity, you, you might not have enough um, open file handles, for instance. Um, the database might be, you might, like, I wait, you might be, okay, so you might have too many connections on the database. RQ and soft, then interacting with your devices is, is the most common issue. We don't see that much anymore, but we used to on older software hardware. Idle time, it's usually caused by you have a lot of contention. There are running threads that are not running on the CPU. And user time. So user time is where we want to profile, because that's when we spend time on the CPU. And that is where we can actually do fine tuning. So tools. We're going to first look at the observability tools, and then some benchmarking tools, and tuning. So 
first we want to, as I said, observe the system and see what we can figure out. So some of these tools uh, is very basic and we often don't need, like if you're experienced, I'd said, you can spend two, three minutes just walking through these tools and you'll give a good, have, or you will have a good um, idea on what is happening on your machine. So the first one we can look at is actually top. I'll go through them. This is just an overview. Let's just continue with top. Um, it's very basic, but it's actually giving you just a very brief overview over your average um, usage. Um, it uses a lot of CPU, so I don't want you guys to have this running more than like a few seconds at a time. Actually, you don't have to run it. There are other tools that will just display, but it is a very easy, nice tool to just get an overview with. Um, if you press one, it's like a hidden gem, but if you press one in top, it will actually list all the CPUs for you. So not just the average, which can be nice. Give you another example of if you have processes just running on a few CPUs instead of all of them. Oh, um, D message is often overlooked, but we find it very, very um, useful because we can, if you have errors in your application that caused by out of memory or other things, then looking at the D message very quickly will give you an information of what is happening. So it's overlooked, but we do recommend that you just peek on it a few seconds, go, go from there. Free, same thing. You just want to look at, okay, do we have enough memory? And it should be like, usually you should have more memory than you can count, which is like the rule of thumb. Uh, don't be too anxious if like free on memory is not um, that high, because it could be just buffered, so you'll still have it free anyway. And so to some more interesting commands. So VM stat. Uh, so that will actually give you a r fairly good overview over the number of processes running. And if you have a lot more processes running than you have CPUs, then you know that those processes will be waiting for a CPU to run, which is something you would like to avoid. Might not be always possible, but it shouldn't be a very high number. So on. Uh, as I said again, um, process is sleeping. It's also interesting to know. Um, free, as I said, it should be high. You shouldn't be able to count it. That's just a rule of thumb. Um, and then you have also CPU usage on the different um, processes. So system idle, wait, system time, user time. MP stat gives a good overview of CPU time. So we want to, I recommend doing this instead of top, but top is easy to use. This might be a bit hard to remember or look at, but it will give you an overview over all the CPUs. And it requires a lot less CPU than top. So SART, um, it's uh, system activity information. It is actually a very useful tool to look at. You could, in this slide we have, it looks on the um, and devices so we use like uh, slash n dev. And then you could also, so this is looking at the number of packets received and transmitted per second. And there's another one. Uh, so this reports the TCP network. You can also report errors, which is very useful. So if you see that you have like resend packets, you know that there's something happening on your network that's not optimal. So if you have like latency problems, perhaps between your database and your app server, and you see retransmits, then you want to look at your network. And then IOSTAT, just monitoring the IO devices. Mostly useful on, on databases, but also on app server. So 
Java tools that we have in our toolbox. There's not that many. Um, there is uh, in the command line, there are like JSTack and JSTack and JCMD. They might look a bit cumbersome, but they are really useful and they usually require less CPU than if you use like Visual VM or something to connect to the VM. So if you just want to do a heap quickly, um, we, uh, we uh, recommend just using JSTack. It is actually very, if you get used to looking at the stack trace, it is very informative and it will give you a good uh, overview over which process is running, which is waiting, if someone, something is blocked. Um, so JMAP, it prints out the shared memory maps. So you see like Eden space, you have survivors, zero and one. So it will give you a good overview over what is tenured, what's not tenured, etc. cetera. Um, you will also get this, as I said, in Visual VM, but this is command line tool, which is very easy to use. They're easy to script. So it'll give you a good insight without causing too much overhead. So JSTAT, it's also a really, actually a powerful tool. It has a lot of different options. Uh, uh, slides have been skewed here, but, so there's, uh, you can see the class loaded, compiler, GC. So this is showing GC util again. So it's just showing what the GC is doing and how much it is pushing over to the different heap spaces. So um, internal tool that we use a lot, which is also causing fairly little overhead, but it requires you to do some changes to the, um, uh, you can use this by runtime. You don't have to set it before you start the, jam, the Java process. So it simplifies a lot of tracing and monitoring. We do it, use it for a lot of our debugging. So this is just a simple rule to log when you do, um, uh, when the app server stops. Um, so it is, um, it was created by Andrew Din from Red Hat and he's doing some other presentations here today. So I recommend checking those out. Um, so Java tool. Um, they're not that easy to use, but they're really powerful. We do recommend you taking a look at those when, instead of connecting to the um, JVM through Visual VM or J console, because starting that up it really hits or creates an overhead on your on your um, Java process. So the final thought or the final like message I want to give is that it's not which tool you use or prefer that's important. The important thing is that you can measure everything. So it's really important that you have a good overview over everything that's happening on the machine before you go further and want to profile. You can always use like the hit and miss. So you, you can always, always guess what's wrong, but we, in, in most cases it will just cause you to spend a lot of time where you don't have to do. So profilers, so you have a lot of CPU load and you want to profile where your bottleneck is and can profilers actually help you? So let me go over here. So as, as we said, like CPU profiling limitations, so a lot of the stuff we do on the profilers can't be shown on it. So all the, if it's not on user time, if, you're, if your machine is spending time on IOA system kernel, it will not show in any of the profilers you're doing, especially on Java, other profilers as well. So, and none of the profilers we'll show here except one show any, if you do garbage collection, if you do any heap stuff on, on your JVM. 
So there are like two different profilers. There are instrumenting and sampling. Instrumenting, we don't use that anymore. I'm not sure if any one of you use it anymore, but we don't recommend it. It just adds too much overhead. Uh, sampling is where you find almost all the profilers are doing that. Um, so I'll try to explain what they do and why they do it. So since we're that many, oh, what happened? Oh. Have any of you used the profiler? There's one user profiler, yeah. So what's happening here? So this is just a survey made from Rebel Labs. So I guess most of the, the majority have, have used a Visual VM, J Profiler. Some use Mission Control, your kit. So all of these are sampling profilers. Um, all of them use the same technique to sample, but So let's look at what a sample profiler do. So a sampling profiler will, at a certain timestamp and a regular interval, do a sample or try to fetch a sample. So let's say, OK, we have this kind of code. There's a main thread. It's calling controller do action. That calls, again, find user, which either creates a new user or fetch user. So and here we see that, OK, there might be some methods this sampling profiler will miss because it doesn't sample often enough. And so what, we, what can we do with that? Well, we can add more samples, which is what actually most samplers will do. Um, but <clears throat> most profilers, so almost all profilers, use a method called get call trace from the JVM TI. So it's a tool interface that comes with a JVM. And that triggers a global save point. And when it has that save point, it will collect a test stack trace. So do people know what a save point is? No. So a save point is a global flag, well, just say that save point is actually not defined in the spec, but all the JVMs that we have that at the moment have, a, have implemented save points. So save points is a global flag. So it's when it's used for garbage collection. So every thread is polled at certain times, and it might do a garbage collection. It might do other things. So and that happens on a method enter or exit or what, what they call an uncounted loop. So an uncounted loop is like a while loop. A for loop with an integer is not an uncounted loop. If you have a for loop like with longs, it's an uncounted loop. So for every iteration of like a while loop or a for loop that's not int, it would actually do a poll and check, OK, is there like a flag saying I should do something? So that's on a safe point. So a save point can be delayed. So if we have large methods, and they're doing a lot of stuff, large for loops, doing a lot of things, a save point can be delayed. So let's look at the sampling profiler again. And let's see, in this example, let's say that um, in the back end find user, um, new user and fetch user, they're inlined. So that's not a method call. That's inline now in the method. So there's no way of getting to that save point until you're actually at the end of the find user method. So this, the sample you try to do in the middle of there will never happen. It'll be moved over until it comes to the same point. So the same thing with other methods. If they're inline or if they do logic that prevents them from from getting to a safe point, that will cause the profiler not to profile that method. 
Um, another problem with the save point, which actually is even worse, is that it's a global stop the world flag. So let's say you have many threads. Um, you send like a stop the world to one thread, and that thread might be um, at a save point. So that will stop. The next thread might not be at the save point, but it it won't f it won't do any fetching of the stack traces until all the threads are at the save point. So you might have to wait a long time until all threads are at the save point before you actually can fetch a stack trace. So when you do monitoring, or if you do use J like Visual VM or your kit or other profiles like that. We do recommend that you actually use these options, which will give you an idea of how much you can skew the results when you do sampling. So if you see that there, you have a lot of um, uh, waiting until you get to a safe point, you know that your samples will probably be skewed so we don't know what, exactly what is happening. So. And then there are some profilers that work better. And they're, they're <coughs> they use a different method call, which is called async get call trace. And there's like three profilers we know of right now that does it. There's Java Mission Control, which is very good. The problem is that it's not OpenJDK. And you have to, if you're not, if you use it in production, uh, you have to pay a fairly big Cost to think if you don't pay, Oracle will take your kids or whatever. I don't know. Um, there's Oracle Solar Studio, which is a hidden gem, as you say. It's actually free, and it does the same thing as Java Mission Control, so you can actually use it in production. Um, and it works on Linux. It has a really bad name. It says Solar Studio, but it works on Linux, so use it. It's free. And then there is an uh, open source project called Honest Profiler. It was initiated by the developer from Google, actually, that did um, just a proof of concept. And then a guy called Richard Warburton created Honest Profiler, which is based on the proof of concept that he did, So, which is a really, really good profiler. So all of these, profi all of these profilers we actually recommend you to use in production. They add a lot, um, very little overhead. Depending on, depending on how much you do profile, though. Uh, mission control, if you um, buy it and make sure that you have the correct license. Um, if you decide to log everything, the log file will be, will be gigabytes. So that usually have a big impact. We use it during development as well. We've used it. We still use it. Um, but when we use it, we try to specify what we want to find. So if we want to look at contention, we only log contention and nothing else. So by that, we just minimize the impact the profile will have. Uh, I think I've um, captured some of this. So yeah. Uh, some of the options, which is actually very important to use, is that with um, unlock diagnostic VM options and debug non-safe points, you, you will make sure that um, they can actually capture stack traces without being at the safe point, so which has the benefit of the other profilers who had to, had, to, had to be on the safe point to get a stack trace. Um, I wanted to say that Honest Profiler actually enables those two options when you start it. So you don't have to do that. So it is actually a very, very neat tool. It's a bit more cruder. It's open source. They have a CLI and a GUI, uh, but it's really, really informative. So what's the problem with Java profilers? And the problem is that it's a Java stack only. So it doesn't show any of the system time. And it doesn't show any GC, deoptimizations, 
and native code like array copy or what the scheduler do or whatever. So this is a flame graph which is created from perf, which is a native tool. So it's just there to display. Uh, this is only Java code, the green one we see here. It's unfortunately a bit too small. I'll show you a bit zoomed in picture later. So all the black uh, pieces there are um, system time that a Java profiler won't show you. So the, what we call here is a flame graph, and that's created by perf. So perf is a Unix tool or POSIX tool um, that is used for a system, as a system profiler. And previously, it was not usable for Java. There was no way we could do it because Java had an optimization that it would use all the frame pointers. So perf did not have a way to walk the heap. So a very smart guy from Netflix called Brendan Gregg made a suggestion to Oracle that we could add an option that would remove the usage of this pointer and perf would, would be able to walk the stack. Um, so usage of that pointer is not enabled by default like in GCC. So in C++ applications, it's free. Um, on the reason Java uses it, it's from legacy on 32-bit code when you had just 32-bit registers. So it made sense to optimize it. On 64-bit, it really doesn't give you much so when we run with that option, there's like zero to three percent overhead. We've usually not seen any. And that gives the capability to perf to actually do profiling. So this is just a image of what um, flame graph, which is a Perl script that would actually just um, parse the output from perf and give it to you as an SV, SVG file. I'll show you on my, in my browser later. So it will, it will give you a bit more information that I, I show here. But So the red one is system time, and, and the yellow one is C++, and the green one is Java. So this is snapshot taken in the middle of a big benchmark run. So all the interpreters, all the optimization compiling has already been, do, been done. But if you want to do that, if you want to see the whole complete picture, I recommend using pro, like perf from the beginning, beginning when you start up Java. Might not be that in, interesting, but. So the flame graph, I just want to show how it works. So the top edge shows the method in which it's using CPU. So the edge size will actually show how much CPU is spent on that method. Um, and you will also have the number of samples and the percentage of the, all the samples you have. So this is more of a zoomed in view. This is from our uh, EAP stack. I'll give you a bit more. Um, Give another example later. So for instance, here we see that, OK, there's a hybrid method that actually eats a lot of CPU. And then there are infinite spans. So that's our caching. So that's also keeping a lot of CPU. And what we've seen is that perf is actually the best tool we have now to give a honest or the best overview we can find running a big um, Java application. It has less overhead and it shows where you actually spend CPU time. Uh, there are some limitations, mostly going on inlining. Um, but lately, there have actually been improvements. So there, there are some experimental, well, it's actually been committed. So Perf can show inline now. The flame graph hasn't been updated quite yet, but in 
upcoming weeks, I think that will be solved as well. So all the inline methods, all the methods you call on on a Java stack will be shown in uh, in Perf and Flame Graph. So we use Perf for almost all the CPU prof profiling we can do. It's our like go-to tool after we've like looked at monitoring. Uh, we use mission control mostly for contention and thread an analysis. We use Onus Profiler a bit now as well. Um, but those are the tools that we use the most. Um, see, like Perf also have a feature called off the heap or off the CPU. So we can actually also profile what is happening off the CPU, not only on the CPU. So <clears throat> benchmarking, we're also doing that. And there's a famous quote saying that most benchmarks are flawed, wrong, and full of errors. And they mostly are. And I'll show you that we did the same thing as well. Um, but it, it is like the only tool you have to actually try to see if your changes actually makes a difference in a controlled environment. And the tool we only recommend using is the JMH, the Java Micro Benchmark Harness. So that is the best tool for you to not be fooled by the optimizations the JVM is doing. If you try to do your own micro benchmark by having like um, doing some for loops, blah, 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 you are most likely fooling yourself because the JVM will try to optimize and in small test cases, um, it will do changes that you do not think it might have done or will do. So we just default to this. So every benchmark that people do is not doing that. That's a micro benchmark we, we just don't look at anymore. On the load testing frameworks, there are two tools that we try to go to, and that's Gatling. Both are open source. So Gatling is a um, Scala um, project. Uh, it, it's using Netty and Akka, so it's a very um, uh, performant um, profiling tool or a driving tool. So it drives load. Um, the problem is that it only supports one driver. There is a, you can buy a professional Gatling tool that I think supports scattering from mul multiple drivers, but we haven't used that. Uh, Fabian is a Java tool. It's older, it was created by Sun, adopted by Oracle. It's used by the spec org for their benchmarks. Uh, we use it um, when we want to drive load on multiple drivers. Um, so it's, um, it requires more um, resources than Gatling, but it's still a really good tool to use if you have to use multiple drivers. So uh, going from Hibernate 4 to Hibernate 5, we made several improvements. And one was the caching layer. So we created a new cache for um, immutable entities. One of the problems we had in Hibernate 4 was that we created a lot of the memory. Or we created a lot of memory on the heap. So we created a JMH benchmark. And this was the result we got, which was like very good. We had like 132. Uh, percent improvement versus Hibernate 4.2, 4.3, I mean. This was with simple cache, so it's a uh, local cache uh, with, without eviction. Um, so it's on um, immutable objects. So we were really pleased with this. So during the Wildfly 10 development stage, we wanted to test it on a big enterprise benchmark. And the response times we got were 10 to 5 to 10 times slower. And we were CPU bound. And we had no idea why at all. Um, so 
we started profiling. We didn't know what else to do because we, we trusted the benchmark we had done. It showed that we had really good performance. So what we saw, this is flame graph. So what we saw on Blockfly 10 was that we had one method that convert cache entry to entity. So it's fetching a cache, cache object and then converting it to an object that Hibernate can actually use. And it was took, taking up like a uh, quarter of the total CPU. And on EAP6, it used like 5%. So we tried to figure out what had happened. So during debugging, we actually found out that it, wasn't, it was compiled and then was decompiled. And we didn't know why. So what we had done in Hibernate 5 was that we had changed one class from being um, one single class to, uh, to an interface with two different implementations. And it was an implementation, one for immutable objects and one for uh, or immutable entities and one for mutable entities. So what we, the problem we had done in the benchmark was that in the benchmark, we only tested either mutable or immutable entities in one benchmark run. So then uh, Java would optimize uh, that method and just run as fast as it could. Um, when we run it on Wildfly, where we had two implementations of that class, it was something we call um, bimorphic call site. So it's not a monomorphic call site anymore. And Java couldn't optimize that. So we actually saw that that method was actually not compiled. It was interpreted. So what we actually ended up doing was checking we, an instance of check if this is a immutable or if, if it's a mutable entity. And then we did two different call sites. And then we made sure that that actually method would be compiled and inline again. But the micro benchmark didn't show that because we were just using one implementation at a time. So when you're extending an application, adding subclasses to, or subbing, subclassing, or adding more um, sub, um, classes to an, uh, to an interface, be wary that that actually can have a direct impact on the performance in Java. Um, so if, we, if you have a hot method and it accepts an interface class and you know that you will have multiple implementations of that interface calling that method, that method will be hard pressed to be optimized. Um, we, don't, we actually sent this method to our JVM engineers because the spec or the spec says that a bimorphic call site should be optimized, but in this case it wasn't. So we can't always guarantee it. They said it was a bug in the open JDK, but it hasn't been investigated further. We just fixed it. Um, so the lessons learned is that benchmarks are good, but they should always be questioned. Because you can usually not test everything in the benchmark. So, yeah, and we ended up fixing the CPU usage without costing more memory. So we have some time, and I'll try to go through some of the performance highlights for EP7 as well. Oh, that didn't look good. Let's do, just do this. So overall, what you get with just operating to Hibernate 5 is that in most cases, you will get at least 50%. I'm a bit conservative in this number, so we will say you'll get 50% reduced memory usage. Uh, a lot more if you're using several immutable objects. If you're using um, infinite span as a cache as well, then the benefit will be a lot better. That was one of the problems we saw with Hibernate 4 was that it just created so much garbage. So, and you're running on a high rate, the GC would just take up so much CPU, so you'd be hard pressed to, to uh, scale further. So in a cache improvement, simple cache, 
Um, that is just uh, what we saw on an infinite span was that for local caches, we were still going through a huge number of um, methods. It's the interceptor stack, uh, which were not needed. So we optimized that as well. Another thing that we added to Hibernate 5 is the pool optimizer. So when you create a new object in Hibernate, it will fetch an ID for you. And usually you, you create, you fetch many IDs at once. And previously, if you r ran out of ideas, IDs, then it would fetch another bulk. But with the pool optimizer, it will actually see if you're starting to get to the end of the number of IDs you're actually fetched, it will try it in another thread fetching more IDs before you're running out. So it is, um, we saw that that caused a lot of contention on hard pressed um, applications. So this, yeah, the pool optimizer, you need to specify that. Uh, the other things, same thing with simple cache on immutable entities. The other, th other um, um, improvements you get for free. We also have a number of bytecode enhancements in Hibernate now. So if you enable, like what we say, enable dirty tracking, uh, entities will be self-aware if they are changed or not, which will make Hibernate more quickly see if there's changes to that entity and quickly decide if it needs to be stored or not. Um, just running out of time, so I'll just skip. Um, so reference entities is Something we had in Hibernate 4 as well, but added here because it's a very good uh, op option to use because it uh, will enable Hibernate to actually uh, cache the entity object itself into cache, so it won't transform it every time it fetches it from cache. Oh, everything is skewed. Let's just do that. So, hmm. anyway. So Iron Jackimar is our JCA implementation, so that means it handles all the connections to the database. So under EP6, we saw that we had a big contention issue with the managed connection pool. So in EP7, it is a new default pool, which is a lot more performant when you have many threads trying to get a connection. Um, in EP6, there were... Um, logging that was enabled by default. So we turned that off. Unfortunately, not, not everything is disabled. So there's something called enlistment trace, which will, if you don't set that to false on your data source, um, our Injacumar will actually create uh, an exception object every time you fetch a connection. And creating an exception object will walk down the whole call stack. So it's a, actually a really costly thing to do. Another thing is the fairness. So it's set to true to default. Uh, we see that under high contention, it's a lot better to put it to false. And then one of the big things that's changed from EP7 is that we've changed from JBoss Web or Tomcat to Undertow. So it's a non-blocking um, web server. It can be blocking as well, but non blocking is the default. Um, Tomcat was a blocking um, web server, so you had to add one thread for each connection. So we have a benchmark, which is a very simple hello servlet benchmark that we ran on EP64 and EP7. And as you can see, the response times for Undertow are a lot greater than Tomcat. So if you use only Tomcat as an embeddable um, web server or you use EAP, then you get a lot for free in this version. I do recommend you to, to look into um, Undertow. It is a really, really great project. It is lightweight. Um, I think the jar is like one meg. 
if you start it up, it takes like four megabytes on, the, on your heap. It's embeddable. It has this builder API to start it up with. It supports HTTP2 and also HTTP upgrade. So some other EP performance tricks. There is, uh, if you use EGB remoting, we recommend you to do pooled buffers, which would um, have a great impact on your memory usage. And last item is actually kind of important as well, is that if you just upgrade and you don't use CDI, EAP7 will, by default, enable CDI, which adds a bit of overhead on all your entities, or all your beans, actually. So we recommend you to disable CDI in your config. And that is all I have. Are there any questions? And I think I'm a bit on time as well, so thanks.